right. Well, okay. let's call, call okay. the State Board of Meeting, uh, State Board of Education meeting to order on March 25th at 9 a.m. Um, yes, I see Barbara has joined us. So um, I have had my second vaccine and I will be immune here in another couple of weeks. So next meeting, I will be there in the boardroom with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Betty. Um, oh, thank I, have you. To admit, I have to admit, it's kind of nice, nice not to get up quite so early to drive, but <laughs> it's better to be there. Okay. All right. Well, so our work session today has to do with therapeutic classrooms, which sounds very interesting to me as I read it. And so I will turn it over to, uh, I suppose, Brad first. Yes. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I hear you. Ter terrific. Well, it's good to be with all of you this morning. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. I'm sharing some slides now. Are folks able to see that? Yes. 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 Okay, good. Um, I'm just making sure I can see all of you too on my screen. Okay, um, so uh, uh, between myself and my colleagues who uh, will introduce themselves in a minute, in a minute here, Kathy and, and Barb, um, we really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about um, some really exciting work that's going on in light of uh, legislation from the last session for mental health. And that is, as uh, Betty, you noted, around therapeutic classrooms. So this uh, originated um, from legislation from the last session, uh, Senate File 2360, that was signed into law by Governor Reynolds uh, back in June of 2020. So it uh, provides a lot of things, a real comprehensive approach to creating safe learning space for students. And teachers, we've already put some, out some guidance around that. Um, I'm wondering, Kathy uh, or Barb, could you put a link to our slides and make sure that they are accessible um, in the chat window so you can, uh, so everyone on the board can have those slides. Um, but there's a link on this particular slide that will take you to guidance that we've already issued around Senate File 2360. Um, and there are multiple things in there, but we're going to talk specifically about therapeutic classrooms here today. So what is uh, a therapeutic classroom? We got this question a lot, uh, especially when the legislation was moving through the process last session. Um, so part of what is defined is that, what is a therapeutic classroom? And I don't necessarily wanna read the definition at you, but what I really wanna highlight here is that this is uh, a therapeutic classroom is something for providing support to students that have social, emotional, behavioral health needs um, they're interfering with their ability to be successful in school. And we're going to unpack that here a little bit um, because you might be able to say that about a few things, but there's some particulars around therapeutic classrooms that are important to note. But that's the definition that's in the law now. So why are funded therapeutic classrooms important? Really want to leave uh, the beginning of this uh, introduction on these points because we want you to carry these through with you as we are talking through some of the particulars. Um, one of the reasons why therapeutic classrooms that are funded are important um, is that uh, there are some students that just have really intense social, emotional, behavioral health needs that require specialized training that uh, your typical teacher, no matter how much training they have or are skilled they are, um, don't typically have that specialized training. So having uh, teachers and professionals that focus on students with intense social, emotional, behavioral health needs is really important. And this legislation helps uh, tee some of that up. Um, this legislation also improves access to those types of services. Um, there are students with social, emotional, behavioral health needs that get those met through special education services. Um, but some students aren't necessarily going to qualify for special education, but still have needs like this. Um, an example would be a student that maybe has experienced significant trauma in their life that has uh, carried forward into some mental health concerns um, that wouldn't necessarily um, be flagged for special education, but they still have needs. So this legislation really broadens the net of opportunities that we have to provide services. Um, and by having these types of services 
in a school, um, it really embeds the service with the kids and in the context that they are in. Um, which the closer that we can get with service delivery to where students are spending their time, uh, the more likelihood we're going to see fidelity of implementation and ultimately positive impact for kids. Um, and having funding is huge for this as well. Um, these uh, services tend to be expensive. Um, and a lot of times, especially out of the gate, trying to start up a, a new program, um, schools don't have space in their budget to be able to um, start up a therapeutic classroom program. So the funding here is critical um, and we're very grateful that this opportunity is here. So three big ideas for th funded therapeutic classrooms. They can address really intense needs. It can improve access to services and it fills a really important funding need. Those three things uh, are big ideas we want you to, to carry with you here as we go. So we wanted to lay that out before we got into the nuts and bolts. So you had some of the context. What we wanna talk about here today is how this aligns in our view with uh, your goals as a board. We wanna talk about the legislation a little bit. And then there's one specific aspect of that. There's a therapeutic uh, classroom grant that um, we've got going that uh, we wanna share some of the work that we're doing to enact this legislation. So briefly, alignment with board goals and priorities. Um, in our opinion, uh, your priority around creating safe, healthy, and welcoming learning environments and the goals that live underneath that um, are a good uh, reference point for this work that we're trying to do as an agency around therapeutic classrooms and this legislation. So in terms of helping drive our work, that's what we point towards is um, these go this priority and the goals that you've got within that priority area as a board um, around safe, healthy, and welcoming learning environments. So we wanted to make that connection here at the outset as well. And we know how important the, the goals are to you as a board and, and um, we are striving to, to reach those goals. And so this work we think fits really nicely with that priority and, and set of goals. So with that, I believe I am turning things over to uh, Kathy and she's going to start getting into some of the details around the legislation. Yep. And Brad, you can just go ahead and keep sharing and navigating. That'd be great. Well, it's nice seeing everybody again. I'm an admin consultant for MPSS at the department. And I know I've been here talking about a few other things. And so it's nice seeing you and, and having me back. And, um, and I've been working collaboratively with Barb Anderson and a variety of other persons as we have been um, implementing this legislation. And so there are, are two pieces within the legislation that, um, that are key for therapeutic classrooms. So you can go ahead, Brad. Uh, those two pieces um, within this are there is a the the legislation requires us to develop a therapeutic classroom incentive grant, and this grant is um, almost 1.6 million dollars uh, that appropriated to support public school districts in um, developing this new their, a new therapeutic classroom or taking a program that they already have and adding the therapeutic components uh, so that it can become a therapeutic classroom. And so when Brad talked about the resources needed to develop a program and, and um, and really like train teachers up and, um, and engage their, their district and, and community in understanding what therapeutic even means, um, these would be some of the resources that helped to do that. Um, it is an upfront grant, meaning that um, districts are applying about right now and the applications are due in April. And then um, they would have the funds starting in the fall, those that, those that, have, that um, meet the competitive requirements. And then they can use those dollars uh, next year to really build their therapeutic supports and components, um, including things like training teachers, uh, collaborating with mental health uh, professionals to make sure they have evidence-based practices in place um, and, and or expanding on supports they already have in the district uh, to, to meet their student needs. And so uh, they're one-time upfront costs uh, to get their programs started. 
the second piece within this legislation is a uh, classroom claims piece. So one is one question districts have, well, how can we sustain these efforts, right? Um, obviously the kinds of supports that students need for, for therapeutic supports are not a typical uh, typical classroom educational kind of experience. And so how do we sustain the kinds of experts that are needed or the kinds of, of um, social emotional support that are needed? And so uh, the, the component of this legislation allows school districts to receive um, some reimbursement for transportation and also reimbursement for uh, services for therapeutic classrooms. Uh, for those students who don't already have um, a waiting through like, for example, special education. Um, and that uh, reimbursement, as a, it's at about 1.5 um, a waiting. So like um, the student's typical waiting for one is about uh, 7,000 something, right? And so be 1.5 of that. Uh, so about one and a half of that. And so uh, right now there's $500,000 appropriated to support reimbursement for uh, those services and transportation. And then uh, just an important note that these uh, funds were, were uh, appropriated last, uh, last session. And then we're just waiting to, to assure that they're obligated for this next, uh, this next uh, year as well as, as the budget planning and budget process uh, is undergoing. So. So we're going to kind of switch to talking about the competitive therapeutic classroom grant um, as that one has really the therapeutic components within that. So as I mentioned, those applications are due April 30th and um, we have a therapeutic classroom grant website and we're not going to go dive deep into that because there's lots of tools and resources on there but it provides some guidance for districts, a place where they can answer questions. We just put out a, um, a frequently asked question that men, that districts uh, uh, had asked us um, as they're getting ready to submit their applications. And it provides also some, um, uh, like a white paper is what we would call it on evidence-based practices for therapeutic classrooms. Um, just as this concept is kind of new to some districts as well. And so they're building their knowledge and skill, skills in understanding these concepts as they're developing it too. So that's part of what these uh, upfront funds can help them do is build Build, uh, build their background to be able to support students in these ways. So we're gonna kind of get into some of the details. So um, this therapeutic classroom grant is for public school districts. And as I mentioned, to establish those classrooms in their district. Uh, the legislation puts into place a few things that we have to, um, we have to assure as we're, as we're um, uh, identifying the school districts who receive this award. And one is that it, it requires us to, um, to give highest priority to those applications who plan to serve the most students, but then um, it also requires us to equitably uh, 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 award those, uh, those uh, grants across small, medium and large school districts. So we're not having a small school district compete with a large school district for the numbers of students that they're, um, that they're serving as well. Um, and then last, it would um, also uh, require us to um, make sure that we're distributing those funds across the state, right? We have something called our mental health and disability service regions. I might turn to Barbara Brad to talk a little more about these. Um, but basically, they're mental health regions across the state, um, kind of divided up across the state. And we just want to make sure that we have um, we have good representation of programs across the state and not just clustered in certain areas of the state. But Brad or Barb, do you want to talk a little bit more about the mental health and disability service regions? Sure. So um, for folks that aren't familiar, imagine, um, you know, how our state for in the education system is divided up by nine AEAs geographically, right? So we've got this large map and we've got nine AEAs that spread out across the state. Well, there's another system um, that's this mental health and disability service region, the regions where the state is divided up um, in a different map, <laughs> according to these uh, regions, uh, geographically, where different services uh, outside the school system are provided. Uh, and so th what this legislation did was make sure that um, in consideration of that map, 
I believe there are 16, Barb, correct me if I'm wrong, 16 um, mental health uh, and disability service regions, just to make sure that we are spread out geographically across those um, so we get good representation across the state. Barb, is there anything else you would add to that? And the only other thing that I would add is just that there's an opportunity in this grant um, for uh, the applicants to partner with those regions so that they can really have that continuum um, of services uh, and, re and establish community partnerships, um, both with the, with the mental health uh, service providers in the community, as well as potentially other districts and, and their AEAs. Yep, Barb, that's a nice segue to um, to some of the pieces that we'll be talking about in a little bit in terms of their grant application as well. So thanks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the grant award is, um, it, it's awarded based on the number of students that districts plan to serve. And it ranges somewhere between 50,000 and 150,000 with the 150 ranging for those uh, schools that are providing services to more students like that, the students the groups that are like 11 to 15 students. Um, so you can see those those funds can go pretty quickly, right? When you're talking just about $50,000 or so. And so that's why they're startup, um, startup funds. And then, um, you know, we can only hope to get enough applicants to spread out across the state, right? But if we have, um, if there are funds remaining at the end of the, the year, uh, because we just didn't have enough applicants, uh, we would of course uh, provide those grants again um, and make those available in a, in a subsequent year as well. So, and that's required as part of, of, the, admin, of the code requirement. Um, <clears throat> so the competitive applications, um, uh, Barb mentioned that um, on our grant website, um, districts can find a kind of informational video, a webinar about how to apply, what are the important components, the resources that they have to do that. And then um, the competitive pieces that we're looking for is for, uh, for districts to do a self-assessment of what their, their, their needs are for therapeutic classroom services. While there's, um, key components that we're looking for, we still want districts to match those to what their students need um, and recognize that there are differences across the states in what in, in what students need for therapeutic support. So uh, they're doing that self-assessment of kind of what their knowledge and skills are to be able to them to put in place a, a therapeutic classroom. And they have a rubric that they're they would do a self-assessment on. That's part of the grant application process to help them um, do some reflection first. Um, then they would have a therapeutic classroom plan and we'd want to see some of those key components, those evidence-based components within their therapeutic classroom plan. Um, we would like to see a, a continuum of therapeutic support. So a question might be is, are all of these classrooms self-contained? Meaning do kids go there and, and spend their whole day there? And in some cases they may, but we are always aiming to support students in generalizing to their um, typical settings and opportunities and natural environments. So they should have be planning some, a continuum of supports to be able to do that. And then, um, we want to see that they're evaluating their implementation and their efforts towards implementing their plan. And then as Barb mentioned, <clears throat> that they have an option to collaborate with um, a, the AEAs, with uh, the mental health service regions, with community partners. Um, and so those collaborations give them some bonus in their application process. Not a requirement, but encouraged through, um, through that application process as well. Okay, so now we're gonna head back and kind of um, reflect back on our goals that Brad uh, talked about earlier. And so Brad, I'll, I might pass this back to you. Sure. Um, so we've, uh, we've actually got other information about all this. We didn't know for sure how uh, deeply you wanted to get into to some of this. So we wanted to have a, a bit of a bookend here to say, um, you know, again, we, um, think this work fits nicely uh, within the board's goal around creating safe, healthy, and welcoming learning environments, uh, that priority area and the goals that live within it. Um, but what we wanted to do now, in addition to sort of bookending that, is just open up for questions. Um, we can take you uh, into some concepts that often come up in this work. Um, we can take it to the website if need be, or we can just have a discussion about what we've shared so far. 
So I guess we turn it back to you, uh, uh, Betty and, and the board to see if there are, and just to start some questions that we can address. The question, Brad. Uh, yeah. Are there some success successes stories that you can share with us and how this is implemented in other school, school systems? Sure. Um, so I, I'll start, but I think Barb or, or Kathy, if you want to jump in on this too. Um, we know that um, Green Hills AEA, for example, uh, partners on, I think, three different therapeutic classrooms um, with different districts. Um, the one that comes to mind for me is Winterset, because I believe they've got a therapeutic classroom there. And I think um, based on my conversations uh, with folks in, in Winterset and in the AEA, I think um, they would all say that there's value added for the students, most of the students they've tried to serve, but they're also, in, most of our therapy classrooms are in their infancy. That's one of the reasons why we, this legislation came to be is there's a recognition that there's a gap in service out there. Uh, and so this is a structure and incentive to increase something uh, or access to services, therapeutic classrooms that we know can be really effective. So most of our programs are in their infancy. And so I think they'd say they've been able to both help a lot of students, but also they're learning a lot about how to uh, create sustainable funding and staffing and how to collaborate back with the the, like the, the rest of the school context so they don't become isolated, self-contained programs by default, because that, that is something that um, is a, a potential barrier, right? Is that they become that for students that don't need that service um, to that level of intensity. Barb, is there anything else that you'd add? Um, thank you. I think you summed it up. The only thing that I would add to that is, is that this legislation has really offered an opportunity to have some shared understanding of what are the best practices around therapeutic classrooms. So we know that there are some good things happening out there, um, but, but one program may not look like the other. And so what are the essential elements that we know um, we want to have in place uh, to help uh, students be successful? We, we're just forming the data currently. Yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah. I would add though that like as Barb mentioned, the components you have in the classroom are the most important parts, right? And so one of the things we've provided is, it's called the evidence-based evidence -based therapeutic supports and it outlines the most evidence-based components, right? So when we think about what those are, cognitive behavioral um, strategies. So those are strategies students use in thinking and planning about how they're gonna solve problems that, that they run into and it's a, it's a treatment approach. And then, um, and so that's, that's one example, but um, within that white paper, there's a few more examples uh, that have an effect on um, student outcomes. And so we really wanna see um, schools gravitate to those evidence-based practices um, within their programs. And, and so as Barb mentioned, it's the pieces you have in your program that make it effective, not just having a program, so. Yeah, so, so yeah, Kim, I, to your point, we are just really establishing baseline um, with what's already out there. And by having this, um, we're gonna have a lot clearer picture about what's out there and um, what the services look like. I wouldn't call this uh, a law around monitoring. This law is really around funding and, and getting some more programs up and running. But this gives us a lot more points of engagement to learn more about what's out there. So we can hopefully grow the work over time and support the programs that come up as a result of this funding. You know, Denise, oh, sorry, go ahead. I've asked two questions already. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead, Kim. I'm sorry. Go, Kim. I'll, I'll, I guess. Go ahead. Nationally, um, it's a same, similar question. Nationally, do you know if there's some lo longevity in the nation with such therapeutic classrooms? You know, we did a lot of research as we were developing the therapeutic classrooms. And to be honest, I think like our state, there are um, places of excellence, um, but not any it was very difficult to find uh, information. Um, so I think that this is pretty groundbreaking work uh, and we're excited to be a part of it. Yeah, I, yeah. And how do we support students who may have mental health issues um, and really align that with um, the, the environments to help them to be able to learn uh, and be successful? Yeah, I, I think the, the appealing, one of the appealing parts here and what Barb and Kathy have talked about is 
we know the types of practices that are effective to help these students, but that doesn't mean there are policies and funding in place and staffing and infrastructure for them to happen. So we see these pockets of excellence um, that deliver services that we know are evidence-based, but without some of the funding and policy structures in place, we just don't see a lot of them come up. And so I don't know, as Barb's, to Barb's point, I don't know that um, I was unique in that we don't have a lot of them up yet, but we do feel confident in the practices that are effective. And, and we're going to continue to um, keep our eye on what's happening around the country because that's going to inform our continued support for these programs. I don't think there's any doubt that um, the state resources are lacking in the area of mental health for kids. I just think that's 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 an uphill battle for us, it seems. We just don't have enough uh, people who are qualified to help deal right. with children who have mental health needs. And we have more and more of those, not only because of COVID, but just because of the society that we live in. Mm -hmm. But uh, so a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, would the curriculum be the same in the delivery different? Is, is that what we're talking about? I mean, would these kids be learning um, the same curriculum? Yeah, there's two pieces. One, they have to receive the same um, the same access to the core content standards that all kids have access to. And so when we talk about science standards and math standards and literacy standards, yes, they need to have that have access to those. Um, yes, it will most likely will be in a different way, right? Based on what the what those students need. And and they should also be receiving additional instruction in social emotional competencies in learning how to really really engage in those um, uh, social emotional uh, problem solving and decision making when it comes to things that are stressful and, um, and, and complex, right? So that would be a piece that isn't required right now within our, um, our administrative code is social emotional uh, uh, learning, but uh, we're hoping to expand that as we as we uh, engage in some rules writing and things like that as well. So, um, but yeah, they would have access to the same standards that all students. Yeah, my follow-up question would be the qualifications of teachers <laughs> to use these methods in the classroom. I mean, is this something that we can teach uh, to our staff now? Uh, are special qualifications gonna be necessary for teachers to, uh, to be able to do this and deliver this effectively? Yeah, some of the supports are things that are already in place in some schools for some students. Like, as you mentioned, though, just not enough teachers have them under their belt. And so expanding the use of like um, using effective assessment practices and effect and and behavior intervention planning strategies. Those are things schools do, but they might only have a few teachers who are really skilled at doing that and a few persons from the area education agency who help them. But then uh, the other pieces that uh, social emotional instruction, um, that would be a, a piece that they could uh, expand through this grant and then also the mental health supports they could expand as well. It just seems to me that we need some connection in the community with folks that yep. can can help us uh, with these children. And uh, again, I'm I'm curious as to uh, the availability of those resources in each of the regions that you're talking about now. I would, uh, after maybe if you maybe want to comment on that for me, but uh, finally, if you could send Brad a, a a map with the regions that you're talking about. Uh, I don't think I have one of those. Is it 16? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. If you could send me a map, I'd very much appreciate that. I'd like to see how we've, how we've structured that or how that's structured. Sure. Uh, absolutely, Mike. We'll make sure that all the, all of the board members get uh, a copy of the, the mental health and disabilities region map. That's, that's no problem at all. And I think we would uh, all agree that the connections with community-based services, um, wraparound services, uh, Therapeutic classrooms can be a component of all of that. And therapeutic classrooms is an important piece. It's not going to do everything for, for all of these kids that need the services because a lot of times these, these kids have needs 24-7, right, um, that need particular attention in some way, shape, or form. And therapeutic classrooms are an important part of that, but you're absolutely right. Those additional community-based connections and services. Family supports are all part of a, a comprehensive approach to supporting uh, mental health needs. Thank you, Brad. Thank, yeah, thank you guys. You got it. Yeah. I have a, a series of questions. Um, is there a identification process for a recommended identification to 
uh, know who these students are who need the type of help that we're recommending as uh, therapeutic classroom. Sure. So I'll see if Kathy or Barb, do either of you want to field the, the question? How do, how do schools know which kids need the services? So that would be a process that they develop as part of their district plan, right? So um, you can't have a program if you can't identify like what the services are and who gets it. And so that's one of the support pieces or like the program planning pieces that they need to engage in. It's hard for us to say, oh, it has to be these kids, right? Because our districts are different and our student needs are different. Um, and so um, right now, and we'll see how that works through the grant, right? That could change over time. But right now we're letting that um, we're putting some pieces in place to support districts in making those decisions um, as they're developing their program. Mm -hmm. So while they have common components of best practice, it's really differentiated and really tailored to the needs of that particular uh, school district or that particular region. Okay. Would we have any idea how many students statewide need this type of service or when, when would we know that? Yeah, so that is a, a really good question. And one of the department's um, requirements from that same um, Senate file 2360 um, is that we actually start collecting some of that data um, so that we're collecting uh, referrals to therapeutic classrooms as well as actual transfers to therapeutic classrooms. Because I don't think we have a good idea of um, beyond our students with uh, disabilities and with IEPs. And we don't, have, we don't really have a good idea about uh, how many other students beyond that need those supports. And I think um, getting that information for referrals, right, who, who do not result in um, a transfer to a therapeutic classroom can really help us start identifying that. And that'll be a report that we're required to put together uh, somewhere, somewhere between June and July, I believe. So, um, but it'll be cl uh, closer to the end of, end of the year, so. I think there was a, a mention of a parent or guardian component uh, that could be included or maybe should be included in this type of program that the student is identified. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit at this time or is it still kind of a, a piece of clay that the department's molding? Yeah, there um Districts who apply for the grant are required to engage with families on a couple different um, situations. One, if the student has an IEP, they would be required to engage with families um, for any of the reasons that they do for educational planning with the IEP. So if it impacts the IEP, they would have to engage with the IEP team, which includes the families in making those decisions. Um, if it is a student without an IEP, um, because this may be a fairly restrictive program, there are, we wrote in requirements as well that they would need to engage with families on a, on a kind of every 60 day basis to make decisions about how those supports are working, whether they need to become more or less intensive. Um, and, and, and so that's a, that's an assurance that districts who apply for the grant would, uh, would have to engage in. So. Just one more question and I'll let somebody else ask the question. Um, there's a lot of money coming to the state through ESSA funding. Uh, would ESSA funding be appropriate use um, to, to do therapeutic classrooms if a local school district chose to do so? So I'll, I'll start on that, but would certainly welcome uh, Amy Williamson's on or, or Director Lebo. Mm -hmm. I think uh, if you're referring to the, the stimulus, the ESSER funds uh, and as a result of the pandemic, my understanding would be that there's a lot of flexibility with the use of those dollars, including supporting mental health needs in schools. And uh, so there, there probably is some discretion there for, for districts to, to use some of those dollars to support things like therapeutic classrooms um, that was not contemplated when this uh, legislation started. But let's see, is Amy or Director Lebo, would you uh, have anything else to add related to the use of ESSER funds and mental health? Yeah, and it's actually a little bit more complicated than that because of um, the requirement of the funds to address um, it, it can't be used for things that were sort of already in place and intended right. to be done. But at the same time, it can specifically address um, issues around social emotional health and needs. So 
you know, a straight up answer saying, can you use your relief dollars for therapeutic classrooms? No, but can you use it for the services that are needed as part of that? Yes. And so what we're going to be doing, am I saying that right? Um, we're putting, and I was going to talk about this a little bit later, is we're putting out some guidance on how those dollars can be used. We can't tell districts how to use it, but we can give them scenarios of how you can use it appropriately. So it's kind of a yes for those, even what you talked about, Mike, with those connections with community um, supports, because that is absolutely something we've identified as being a need. So it would go together in that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know that this process is going to be really interesting to see how the district starts to implement their plans. How do you plan to support the student engagement in this process? I know that at my school, I mean, sometimes it seems as if like these students who need these supports may not be able to partake in the process of implementing them, but I actually led some diversity, equity, and inclusion roundtable with these types of students at my school. And I can tell you that they're very capable of getting involved in the process and they have a lot of really great insights on how to, how to make the school experience better. So how do you as a Department of Education um, plan to have support so that districts can fully involve students in this process? Sure, I'll go ahead and start, but uh, Kathy and Barb, please weigh in here. Um, so a little bit of context, and it's a great question. Um, the, there isn't anything in the, the Senate file that I'm aware of that would require what you're talking about, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. That's just part of the context that, that we need to take into account. Um, so uh, I think in my mind, and again, Barb and, and Kathy jump in on this, it's um, uh, as we engage both proactively and as it's going, I think it's going to be important for districts and schools to not only um, hear from students about what types of things would help them as they're working towards their positive mental health, um, but to understand for the individual students that are in these programs, how's it going for them? And so we'd want there to be voice uh, because it is in part for them. So we wanna hear how that is going. Um, and uh, the last note I would add here before turning it to, I see Barb's unmuted is, um, for the department, the work of therapeutic classrooms actually sits inside a larger body of work around multi-tiered systems of support, which is about providing a continuum of supports and services um, based on student needs. And that's why we tie it back to what I'm sharing on the screen with the, the board priority area and goals is there's work happening on other fronts related to student voice and positive climate and culture that we'd wanna make sure that both staff and students understand that therapeutic classrooms are just one of a host of things that schools do to support all the needs that students have. And mental health is just as important as physical health, just as important as academic success, because that's part of normalizing it and making it okay. Um, because as you pointed out, um, students are more than capable of contributing to this going well. And so we want to make sure that it's okay for them to come forward and that um, they're not only supported by adults, but by, by their peers as well. Barb, is there anything else that you wanted to add here? I, I think you did a beautiful job of saying everything I was thinking and eager to share. I love the question. Um, and I, I think that part of this work is in, in, in supporting students in that multi-tiered system um, that Brad described is really um, making it be okay to not be okay sometimes. And how do we do, reduce stigma? Um, how, to we, how do we increase um, self-help-seeking self, uh, health, behaviors and, and encourage um, our peers to be able to do the same? Um, and then self-advocacy is really a part of um, is really a part, of, a part of the social emotional learning, really, how do we um, advocate for our own well being? So I, I appreciate that question very much. I'd just be interested to see how you could develop ways or maybe some guidance on how districts could really involve students as decision makers in this process. Because I think that not only in receiving feedback from them, but is important, I think that is important, but making sure that there's space for them to be invited to the table and have the ability to make decisions in this process too is important. Yeah, really appreciate that input and feedback. And as we're going through the all the particulars, we will absolutely be making sure that uh, student voice is a component of, of supporting 
uh, therapeutic classrooms and, and the larger context as well. Thank you. Red, Kathy, I just might, just might add a thought and nobody has to agree with me, but when I, when I visit schools and particularly elementary schools, and I, I go to a special education classroom, I see a lot of boys. In fact, if I were guessing, I'd say two thirds, three fourths of the kids is special letter boys. And my sense of it is that much of that's about behavior, uh, it, it more so than their inability to learn. And I'm not suggesting that we should, they shouldn't be there. I mean, perhaps they need to be there, but it, it bothers me a lot when I see that. And I'm thinking that a different approach, they need a different approach. They need to be taught in a different way. And uh, this seems to me to sort of fit into that, that idea that uh, we need some folks that can deal with anger and, and all the issues that those, uh, those young children have. But it distresses me to see uh, so many boys relegated. To, not, not that special is a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. It's great that we are trying to deal with kids and help them uh, catch up. But uh, this, this looks good to me. Uh, maybe a great idea. So. Great. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you. Thanks, Mike. And I, I guess what I would note is um, that uh, that is certainly I, your experience, I think, aligns with what we see around the state, what we see around the country and what we've seen for a long time. Um, and at times, sometimes it disproportionately affects uh, boys um, of color as well, uh, yes. disproportionately. And I'm, I'm using that term carefully here because we're, we're not doing a uh, disproportionality analysis today, but um, your, your point is well taken in that um, we not only need to um, help our, our youngest uh, uh, students, their boys uh, and males to be successful with their behavior in schools, but we also need staff and, and peers to um, understand, uh, help them understand um, uh, what boys are trying to communicate and how they act developmentally and how we can create environments where they can be successful. And the solution isn't just your problem. So we're going to put you in an intervention because that's not always the case. Thanks, Brett. You got it. I have a question about just, um, and you may have touched on this before, but it seems that this is like one kind of I mean, I think this is great, but it's kind of one piece of the puzzle. I mean, you kind of mm -hmm. talked about how there are so many, you know, I mean, they might, the, a student who might be using a therapeutic group might be using so many different services, both maybe inside and outside of the school. So I guess, how do all those services kind of communicate with each other about this student? I think you, you talked about like, um, um, there might be like a, um, a district-wide plan. Are there like IEP plans? And then how are those communicated with with folks outside the district. And I know you said parents would be involved in stuff like that. So I'm just wondering about all the, just since this is one part of it, I mean, so in terms of the whole health of the of the child, how does this kind of fit into the whole thing? And then how is everyone communicating about that? I guess mm -hmm. that that child, and I'm, I'm at least sometimes I'm sure it involves DHS and stuff like that, different agencies, I don't know, so. Yeah. yeah, I think there are several pieces of that. So I'm gonna start with like, the paper side of that, right? Because when we communicate, we, we have to kind of have something that we've agreed to. And so students with an individual education plan, right? Like they have that plan that we've all agreed to, we sit down with and we, we, we put together. A student without an IEP, I wouldn't typically have that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, why we've asked, that we've required that for at least for applying for the grant and also seeking reimbursement, that all of those students have an individual or have a behavior intervention plan and individualized one. So it's something we've all agreed to do, right? And so there's that communication piece, at least with the paperwork. Um, but having uh, some team-based decision-making and team-based structure to uh, those therapeutic programs also brings folks together to make decisions as a team and helps keep that communication. So that's where I'm gonna pass it on to maybe uh, one of my colleagues here to kind of talk a little bit more about what that looks like when we're partnering with um, multiple agencies perhaps. Sure, I'll start. And I don't know if you can see on Zoom, but my computer just told me it's restarting in now 14 minutes. So this <laughs> happens, right? Whenever you're doing a presentation for somebody, your computer's gonna <laughs> go ahead and reboot itself. So if I disappear, you'll know why. Um, <laughs> That's perfect, uh, Brad. We're supposed to be done in 14 minutes. So that, that's that's usually the only way you can get me to stop talking. Is, uh, <laughs> no, you just have to shut down. Um, you know, I, I guess what I would add uh, very briefly, and Barb jump in here too, is um, uh, 
a lot of times there isn't great communication and coordination. A lot of times it falls on families and caregivers or individual service providers to run around and make a lot of phone calls or do emails and do a lot of coordinating. Um, this tends to go better when there's a, a structure in place. We call them wraparound services where there's a role of service coordination and there are specific roles that other people play and communication channels that are agreed to um, and services that if one service is going well, how's it impacting the other services and how's that impacting the kid and their, and their family or their caregivers. Um, and a lot of times th there, and there are certainly uh, districts that engage in quality wraparound services, um, but um, by and large, uh, I don't think we probably see that as much as would be helpful. Um, but it's, I mean, again, it's it's a lot of people, it's a lot of coordination, it's a lot of work. It takes funding to do these things. Um, so I think the short answer is a lot of time, it's a lot of people doing a lot of individual hard work trying to get the communication to happen without some formal structures and resources in place to to do it, for it to go well. And like I said, we we usually call those wraparound services. And it's something we're certainly interested in, um, but we certainly are looking for opportunities to get some traction for, for supporting wraparound services systemically. Barb, is there anything else that you would add to that? Um, no, I think you, again, did a, uh, summarize that really well. I would add that not only do we want there to be um, teams and partnerships, um, at the at the intensive level, at that tier th uh, three wraparound level, but also how do we partner with families um, and uh, uh, and and students and all learners um, in, in the preventative and health promotion places as well? Um, so that that we are um, inviting um, folks with lived experience to help inform um, our best practice. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brad and Kathy and Barb. Um, I appreciate you guys making time today. And I know this is an important topic and it was an ask early on. Um, we are even kind of right on time, a little bit ahead. So unless there's any other questions, um, Betty, if you wanna adjourn us for, we're gonna take a break and then come back at 10, we'll be ready to start at 10 o'clock for the regular meeting. Then we'll turn back over to, to Brooke when we start at 10. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Really appreciate it. All right, really informative. Um, Brooke, are you there now? She's here. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, you can't see me. Sorry. Oh, okay. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, perfect. And you can adjourn it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll go ahead and adjourn this session. All right. And we'll come back at 10.